Alrighty. Okay, so let's do a quick review of our notes. This is going to go fast because there's a lot of slides. It's like two weeks of evolution, but here we go. We said evolution is a change in allele frequency. It's a change of organisms over time. Um, and so what we said was, what are alleles? And alleles are the traits, the versions of traits that are found on your chromosomes. So you can have like brown fur and white fur. Those are the alleles. So we said, hey, let's do a case study of how allele frequencies can change over time. So we said the peppered moth comes in two versions, a black version and a peppered version, which is like the white one. And we said that there was a change in the environment. So in England, there was uh, the Industrial Revolution, sort of like made the trees all black with soot. And so the black one, which was basically uh, eaten and seen by birds, became the more dominant one when the trees turned black, black because it was camouflaged. Next, we said that we can sort of repeat this uh, evolution in the lab. You can actually make uh, fruit flies that, that, you know, we said uh, they, the first generation starves after 20 hours. But if you just, after uh, you get your last few survivors, you basically can keep mating those. And generation after generation, the ones with the longest, uh, the, you know, the strongest ones survived. And we went all the way up to 160 hours with fruit flies. That's crazy. All right, so adaptations, we said that's any trait that helps you survive. So we said, what does the walrus have? Blubber, tusks. Um, we said a cactus can hold lots of water. That's an adaptation. These are alleles that get, keep getting passed on. Uh, the owl is camouflage, it's color, you know, yada, yada. <clears throat> Factors that drive a change in allele frequency, mutation, genetic drift, migration, and natural selection. So, oh, that's wrong, sorry. Uh, let's start with the first one, mutation. Mutation is basically a brand new allele uh, is in the gene pool. So this is the first way that new alleles are created. How are they created? Well, you need something called a mutagen. So it's usually like UV rays or X rays or just a weird random change in DNA because DNA actually makes mistakes every now and then. And so you get a whole new thing. Now we said that the uh, mutations can be harmful or helpful. Harmful if uh, the organism has no benefit whatsoever and actually hinders the organism. Like we said, a frog has a third leg. That sounds totally cool, but the organism needs to send more energy, more glucose to that leg. That means it needs more food. That means it needs to hunt more and drag this crazy third leg around. So mutations like third leg sometimes are not good, but mutation maybe like a strange color, a pigment may actually be helpful. The mutation must be heritable. Please don't be fooled by any questions that say, hey, the body cell of an organism changes to green. How about the offspring? They will not be green. The only thing that is, uh, if the gametes, if the change is held in the gametes, then it gets passed on to future generations. Anything that happens in the body, nah. A mutation can may, may or may not help reproductive success. We said blue eyes uh, are a mute. You guys are mutants. <laughs> But um, it does not affect your reproductive success. It doesn't hinder. So sometimes there's mutations and alleles that are just floating out there doing kind of nothing. Genetic drift. This is where evolution occurs because of some crazy random chance. We call it like the lottery. We said that there's two examples, the founder effect and pop, uh, population bottleneck. So the founder effect is basically, basically there's a small group, a small sample that moves to a new location, but that sample includes a large amount of weirdos. And th that makes the new population have more weirdos. Well, what are we talking about? Well, our example in humans is the, we said the Amish have lots of uh, six-fingered people because they're originating, originally, blah, 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 blah. The original, original founders had six fingers and they passed that on. Now, population bottleneck is basically the cheetahs, that something crazy happens, some random change, and the only ones left over, the only survivors, are a small amount of uh, alleles that are left over. And so then the new population over time that regrows is very similar. So cheetahs are very, very similar to each other. Number four and the most famous is natural selection. This is the way that the environment actually affects the organism and affects the alleles. The environment chooses. So anyone who is best for an environment, they survive and they reproduce and they pass on those good genes. 
So this was first described by, we said, Darwin. And we talked about Darwin a little bit. We said he was like the first one to explain how species evolved. He was on this boat called the Beagle in 1831. He was a naturalist, so he like collected tons of stuff we talked about. And he wrote the book called uh, The Origin of Species, which, remember, was very controversial. And he took forever to publish it because he was sort of a little wimp and scared because of religion. We talked about all that. And then there was that young guy named Wallace who also got the same idea, yada, yada, yada. But all his ideas came from his visit on the Beagle to the island of the Galapagos. And the reason the Galapagos were awesome was because each island had a different environment. And so he saw all these cool birds there that were all related except for their beaks. And the reason he said, hmm, was because each island had different food sources. So the bird's beak shape changed because of the environment. So before Darwin, there was some dude named Lamarck that was on the right track. He kind of... Um, for our test, the kind of the one thing I would ask you is why he's still in the textbooks. And it's because he explained that the environment drives change, which was actually pretty awesome. But he said it kind of wrong. He said that acquired traits are passed on. That means that the giraffes that stretch their necks in their lifetime, they're actually their muscles stretch. They kept stretching and stretching. They passed on that, that stretching onto their babies. And that does not happen. Acquired traits do not get passed on. Darwin. Now, this is what really does happen, and it's still happening today, and it's happening to you right now. There's a bunch of different ones of us. That's called variation. Now, there's more except in humans, because we keep changing our environment, but think of squirrels. There's more squirrels born that can survive. There's only so many nuts, so many trees, so many nests. So, the ones that are the strongest, the ones that can get all the nests, and all the nuts, and all that stuff, have beneficial genes. They're faster, they're smarter, they're cuter. And they pass on their genes to their other squirrel babies that survive. The other ones die. So that's the way you explain giraffe long necks. The ones with the longest necks survive during drought times. Yay! Now, uh, remember we said never say that the giraffe adapted or the giraffe needed a long neck to reach the leaves. That does not happen. Basically, the entire population over a long, long time adapts to the tall tree environment okay three things have to happen in order for natural selection to occur the first thing is you need a variation of a trait it makes no sense to have all the same trait all the same size you won't get any evolution or any natural selection if they're all the same size or the same speed in this example second is the trait must be heritable so if it's some weird mutation that happens just on someone's head not in the genes it can't be passed on and the last thing is there has to be a differential reproductive success. That just means that the trait has to be helpful somehow and helps some of them make more babies. Proof! We said there were a bunch of proofs. Fossils shows, um, well, just check your notes on that one. It shows a bunch of stuff. Shows like uh, there's earlier versions of organisms that are living today. It shows how organisms have changed. It shows who's related. Second, vestigial structures or leftover structures or uh, evidence of structures that organisms had in the past, like a whale, used to have legs. It came from a leg-like, <clears throat> wolf-like creature. And so we still see a pelvis. Also snakes, you can see a pelvis of leftover legs. Homologous structures. You basically take organisms that are related. These are all mammals, except for the bird. Yeah, the bird. Yeah. These are all vertebrates, we'll say, and they all have similar bones. They all have like the humerus is one of them. And if you look at the whale, the whale has uh, actually five fingers, which is crazy because their appendages are paddles now. So this shows um, that they were, they share a common ancestor. That's what this shows. Remember the answer, homologous structures show they shared a common ancestor. Now, why does it show them as very different? Like, why does a bat have five fingers that fly and we have five fingers that grab stuff? Well, it's because we adapted to different environments. Okay, so although we have a common ancestor, we are adapted to different environments. Convergent evolution is where two unrelated species like shark and whale totally look alike because of the way they live and the place they live. So sharks all have a dorsal, sharks and dolphins have a dorsal fin. They're very bullet-like, yada, yada, yada. Divergent evolution is where things used to be related and look very, very similar, but they diverged. They went to different environments, and so they changed over time. <gasps> Next, embryology. If you look at the embryos of lots of organisms, like fish, turtle, uh, pig, and human, um, 
their embryos all look the same. And actually, we, during one of our stages, have gills, which is crazy because they don't do anything. And this proves, again, what's the proof? This proves that we had a common ancestor. In the DNA code, we have a code for uh, gills, and we have a code for a tail. You notice we have a tail. Then the DNA, basically the instructions are to get rid of our tail. But if you're a fish um, or a pig, you keep your tail. How cool. Six, DNA. Oh, look at that. DNA, if you look at the DNA sequence or the amino acid sequence of two organisms, you can basically see that if they're related. So look at the resemblance. Look at that chimp kid. Then we basically, our next unit was, we talked about how species arrived. Uh, <clears throat> arise. That's called speciation, the formation of a new species. We then said, hey, how come like different species can't produce? Like how come two different species can't reproduce to make new species? Like let's take a dog and a pig and make a, a, a pog. So we said that there's a couple of barriers. These are called reproductive barriers. The first one is called prezygotic. Prezygotic means before the sperm and egg totally get together and make a baby. So the first thing is the pig and dog are physically not attracted to one, other, one another because of pheromones and odors and cues and songs and all kinds of reasons we came up, check your notes. And we said they're also physically unable to mate. They don't have the proper parts. Use your imagination. So then we said there's post-zygotic. Oh, there was another pre-zygotic. The other pre-zygotic was that the sperm, even though if it gets into the female, like the sperm of a dog goes into a female uh, pig, that the sperm uh, receptors will not be able to be to match the female egg receptors, and so the the sperm won't even like attach to the egg. Postzygotic means that you actually start to make a baby, but the baby does not survive. Chances are the chromosome number is different, um, but you still get an organism like a mule. It's just sterile. We then talked about taxonomy, and we said King Philip comes over for good soup or something like that. And it's for you to remember kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. I will ask you stuff like, where are there more organisms, in a kingdom or an order? So obviously there's more stuff in a kingdom. Order has less stuff. Now, the way we name a species, remember, is with genus and species. Okay, so homo sapiens, yada yada. Oh, and also remember how to italicize. You have to italicize or underline. So make sure that you know the proper way to write a genus and species name. Then we said there's two types of speciation. It can be allopatric, which means that um, the organisms used to be related, but they were split geographically somehow, either by a lake or pond or mountain. And over time, they change so much that they eventually can't reproduce and they're different species. So that's allopatric. And then sympatric is weird. It happens with plants. It's where one plant totally changes its chromosome number, which changes itself. And they start to kind of make their own species and they don't reproduce with the other dudes. So the picture on the right shows that weird population of pine trees. They're now a new species because in plants you can change the chromosome number and they're fine. With us, it doesn't happen. Cladograms. We then drew cladograms, which showed a line with a bunch of organisms. And what you have to know is that every dot shows a common ancestor. And basically what we write, just like this, we write a uh, thing right before um, anything that's written after a line, like jaws. You see on the left jaws. That means everyone to the right of jaws has jaws. The only one that doesn't have a jaw is a lamprey. Okay. Any, the ones that don't have hair are the ones to the left of hair. That's how you do a cladogram. We then said there's an evolutionary tree, which basically goes up. And anything that's at the bottom is, a, is an old ancestor. Anything at the top is alive today. Okay. And that's pretty much it for that. We did evolutionary tree of pasta. And then we said, hey, there's a bunch of stuff. Diversity of life, which you're doing a, a prezion. So basically, we said there are five kingdoms. There they are. The kingdoms can be, um, the organisms can be prokaryotic, which means they're very simple cells. That's bacteria number one, or eukaryotic, which is number two through five. That's a cell that has like lots of organelles and stuff. We then said bacteria are prokaryotic. They can be uh, autotrophs or heterotrophs, by the way, which means they can make their own food. If they're autotrophs or heterotrophs, they eat. We then said protists are also single cells, but they are eukaryotic, unlike bacteria. They're usually in pond water. Fungi are heterotrophs. That means they have to eat. They're multicellular and they have a cell wall. Okay. They also make spores. We talked about lichens a long time ago. Those were pioneer species. Pioneer species basically are the first dudes that end up in an environment. 
Plants, multicellular, they have also have a cell wall. They're eukaryotic and autotrophic. You're going to have to replay this because this is all so fast. And animals, multicellular, heterotrophic, they're eukaryotic, and they have no cell walls. Okay. Now, by the way, all organisms have cell membranes, just so you know. And then we said there are nine phyla. Basically, periphera are your sponges, cnidarians. <coughs> <coughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah, my hand here, and we're hanging. I'll go through these really fast. Yada yada. Just pause if you need to see them. Periphera, sponges, filter feeders, cnidarians, jellyfish, coral, hydras, worms, platyhelminthes. Those are flatworms. Just remember, plato, plate, means flat. Nematodes are your roundworms. Um, and annelids are your segmented worms, like leeches and earthworms. Now, all three worms show cephalization. Cephalization is you start to have a head. So they have eyes and a head. Econoderms are spiny skin. Just remember dermatologist, derms means skin. This means spiny skin. That's your starfish, your sea cucumber, your sea urchin, sand dollar. Next, mollusks. Mollusks come in three classes. Uh, bivalves, which are your bi like bicycle too. Bivalve is your shell, like your mussels, your clams, yada yada. Gastropods are your snails and your slugs. Um, and then your cephalopods are your octopi and squid. So to remember, bivalves is two shells. Gastropod, pod means like foot, and these guys are the ones that crawl on land. Well, some of them are in the sea, but uh, gastro is like stomach, so they look like stomach walkers. And then cephala, remember cephala means brain or head, um, and so cephala means head. <laughs> Arthropods, these are hard shell creatures. They have an exoskeleton. Insects, arachnids, and crustaceans are the three. And then chordata. Chordata is the last phyla. And the one we, there's like a bunch of weirdos that are also chordates, but we kind of care about the class of vertebrates. And there's five of them, which are written there. 